Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alistair Roach. Thank you so much for the conference organizers for putting this on. Uh, it makes me feel less alone being in this lecture theater. <laughs> it feels really good. Um, uh, one second, I just need to plug this thing into my laptop. Um, I want to talk about board developers. Uh, I've seen some things. I've been at companies that were startups that went public and then had to do a bunch of compliance work, which is boring work. And I've seen uh, pro projects go over time and over budget because people are bored. And I've seen startups in London just die lingering slow deaths, even though they were well funded and we ate steak for lunch every day. Uh, and I've seen <laughs> ones in Melbourne that die quick deaths because they don't have any money. And I've seen places where the lead developer will just get fed up with the technical debt that they're creating and piss off and leave the business in a lurch. And I've also been the guy who will charge ridiculously high hourly rates to go in and clean it up. Um, and what you often hear from the people who are leaving is that they want to work on real problems, right? They're just sick of the work that they're doing. So what do they mean by these real problems? Um, one paper that gropes at the solution really well uh, tries to highlight the distinction between essential and accidental complexity, where accidental complexity is just stuff that gets in the way. Like if you uh, need to use the node package manager with Docker, but there's a config file you know that makes it work, but it's on a remote branch on GitHub, but you, <laughs> like Apple has just scheduled a forced update of your phone so you don't have two-factor authentication. And you just want to go and hit something, which I think is why there are so many ping pong tables everywhere in Melbourne. <laughs> uh, and so one day, you know, I was on the, on the road to Damascus or whatever, and I, I, I met Clojure. Um, and I, it made me start reading the things, the, the things that I should have been reading at university. It made me start uh, read interesting new ideas, uh, actual research papers, um, consuming the ideas of people who are much older than me and more experienced and smarter and have been thinking about this problem for longer and just like absorbing some of those ideas. And so I got excited uh, and I, I started talking and I started meeting people. I started um, like writing open source software for the first time in my life and I was filled with energy and power. <laughs> And it was the kind of power that I hadn't felt since I was in year eight. And I spotted the chapter in the manual that said programming. And I realized that I could make games for my friends <laughs> instead of doing math methods. And even though the games are really shit, and like it was a version of Snake where the tail doesn't get longer. Like <laughs> it was powerful, right? And I loved it. Uh, and as I was going through this kind of like closure, power, expressivity, high, something clicked. And I remembered seven years ago being in a, uh, a class on de declarative programming at Melbourne Uni, and a, a replacement tutor walked in. And he was a guy dressed in purple silk, and he had long flowing hair. Uh, and he was telling us about these powerful languages, more powerful than the Python that you're using. And we were all really skeptical, or at least I was. I thought he was a crazy old fool. But uh, he had arguments to back up what he was saying. By the way, his name was Lee Nash. Uh, I think he's giving you a talk later on. <laughs> um, <laughs> and all I can say is that I wish I'd listened to him sooner. But uh, thanks for planting the seeds. Uh, it's, but I'm preaching to the choir because there's no one in this room who would rather write this to work out Fibonacci's sequences like, rather than this <laughs> or this. Um, but there's an open question around, like, you get, that, that you get that switch in power and leverage from switching programming languages, but can you get it from also messing around with the database layer and the languages you use to query the database? And I'm so glad that I got this bottle of water from the vending machine, because I really need to take a drink. <sighs> yeah. Uh, so story one is, when did those venues go live? Uh, I got a message on Slack from Nathan, and Nathan is uh, my, one of my business partners, and he is extremely competent and intelligent and hardworking, uh, and he builds drones and races drones in his spare time. That's him wearing goggles, piloting a drone. Um, but what he was talking about was these venues where people go to book appointments on the website that we run, uh, and those venues go live at some point, but they enter the database earlier as part of the sales, sales cycle, and we send out photographers you know, take pictures to make it look nice, and at some point we push a button and they go live. 
And Nathan was asking the very simple question, uh, when, when did they go live? <laughs> and my first thought was, oh, shit, I didn't actually think of that. Like, that wasn't in the requirements. I haven't been capturing that data. Because if I was using Rails, um, for example, which I was using at my last job, it does a thing where it um, like automatically adds timestamp fields to the records or to the rows in tables about when they get created and modified. But it doesn't actually say anything about when each of those things was changed, like each of the different columns in the row, right? Um, uh, and what we need is to know when one of those things, this, this flag about whether or, not it, whether or not it's live, has been flipped, or like when it got flipped. Uh, and so <laughs> while all this is going on in my mind, Nathan is patiently waiting for an answer to the very reasonable question he's asking about our system. Uh, and so I have a few options where I can be like, <laughs> <laughs> I can just be like, oh, no, that data's just not there. <laughs> but like, next time it will be, uh, I can add a thing to, to like capture it. But uh, uh, maybe, God, it might be a week before I do that, because there's this other stuff. And, just like, and, Nathan, and Nathan would be sitting there being like, what am I doing working with this person? Uh, so there's other options. I can go back and try and infer it from some of the, some of the, uh, the noise that's being generated in other parts of the systems. I could parse Nginx logs, perhaps. Uh, potentially infer when things went live. Uh, I've worked at companies whose entire business intelligence strategy, aka their counting stuff strategy, is predicated on passing Nginx logs and reconciling that with their database at some point in some fashion. Uh, and all I can say is you don't really want to do that. Um, <laughs> the option three, uh, which is the really, uh, I bet you didn't see that coming, um, is that you, I could query my database. Uh, and so um, don't worry particularly if the language doesn't fully make sense to you. This one's called data log, uh, and it is uh, a subset of prolog. Uh, and we, we can talk about it later if you want, because it's exciting. Um, but this is basically saying, uh, if there's some transaction that took place at some time, the instant being the time, took place at some time, and then there's also no accounts that was flipped to active, where active is true and it was in part of that transaction. I want to get back all those transactions and all those accounts. Uh, and if you're wondering why I was saying venues going live before, and this thing is saying account active, that's because of accidental complexity, and it was my accident. <laughs> uh, anyway, you get back a result like this. Um, uh, and it's easy if you want to get the name as well. You just add another restriction. Uh, just add another restriction. Uh, you get back some data that looks like this that you can then uh, do whatever you want with, put it in the admin system, or just like flip your size, like slides back and forwards in a confusing manner. Um, <laughs> if you want to know more, if you want to know more about the query language, this paper is uh, surprisingly readable. It was also written before I was born. Um, uh, I, I highly recommend it, but if you don't have time, if you're, you know, Everyone's time constraint. Uh, this is a, a great interactive tutorial for learning how to use it. Um, key points here are that storage is so cheap. Just, it's, like, it's just not an option. It's not a constraint in the way that it was when databases were first being designed. Um, and then more importantly, you just never know what you'll need to know in advance. When I worked at, um, it's fine to say where you previously worked, right? When I worked at Zendesk, we had stuff that was like we needed to know about years and years ago, but it just wasn't being captured at that time, and we couldn't answer the questions. And it's fair enough, because like who could foresee that? No one could foresee that. Maybe a couple of people in this room who are really smart could foresee that. I, I know that I couldn't. Um, so it's really nice to keep everything, and it's even better if you can get the database to do that for you, because doing it manually is annoying. <laughs> the weirdness has, has costs, though. Like using a weird database with a weird query language has serious costs. This is an, another of my business partners. He was a programmer for five years uh, and knows SQL back and front. And he's used to just being able to make a query to the production database uh, and, and make important business decisions based on that, or maybe even modify stuff for a customer support request. Uh, and now he can't. And it's not just the weird query language. It's the whole architecture and the data model that's different, and it's frustrating for him. Um, and then not just that, but like, the stuff that you can get off the shelf with uh, popular and common frameworks is 
is uh, tremendous and robust and useful. And we didn't have that. Uh, there's no Rails generate. And this hurts. Like, especially in the short term, it really hurts. Uh, like, someone, the other people in your business not being able to easily and quickly manipulate and query. Did I say, <laughs> you know what I mean. Query and manipulate the data in the database is painful and a source of frustration uh, and something that I wish I'd gotten on top of first. And the only way that I can try and justify it to them is by saying, you know what, like, right now things aren't so great, but we've avoided a local optima, which was, you know, using off the shelf the solution that we would, you know, then bang our solution onto on the side, and we'll get one that's custom fit just to our problem, and it'll be wonderful. Uh, and I, I'll say that, well, when a, bu a bug comes up in it, I'll understand it, because I, I built it, or we built it, actually. There's a team of us now, and we know all the parts involved. I can say these things. Uh, and I can say, well, using exciting technologies just gets us shit loads of like, people wanting to work with us. Uh, and this is how I hired Michael, our Australian in Berlin, who is like, I think of him as my six of class Glock of Rosé, and I love him, and hi, Michael. <laughs> um, but the truth of the matter is that like, it sucks right now, and it's, it's like painful, and it's like slowing down our ability to scale across the country because of some design choices I made initially early on where I didn't think hard enough uh, about some of the things that we've been missing out by being weird. And then when you're trying to explain this to the other people in the company, uh, it's a really hard thing to sell because they've just come off uh, a phone call with an angry hairdresser. And hairdressers get angry. Um, that's the point. Uh, there's also the case of Penelope Stone, which is when uh, we had a morning uh, which is, you don't, like, you don't want to have this, you don't want to see that in the morning, right? That's the worst thing you want to see in the morning when you're drinking a coffee. Uh, major issue from a customer. Uh, I don't know if you can read that, but there was this lady called Penelope Stone who just seemed to be, like, taking over someone's calendar book. <laughs> um, and it was causing all this weird behavior. And the customer actually just didn't want to talk to us anymore. She was just like, you look into it, you fix it. And so it's not like I was going to get a clear step of like how to reproduce Penelope Stone, right? <laughs> uh, and so I took a look at her calendar. I'm not showing it here because you know, it was her actual calendar. But yeah, Penelope Stone was all over the place in these bizarre like eight-hour bookings. Uh, and so I said to the database, tell me everything about one of these appointments where Penelope Stone's involved. Um, and it was like, yeah, well, it's only ever been involved in one transaction. And that was by our command called add calendar. I'm oh, sorry, add booking. Um, done via the calendar, and it was run by this user. And I was like, all right. So actually, that appointment has, has only changed over time once when it was added. So I don't think it's the appointment's fault. Uh, so I took a look at the client. Uh, I did a more involved query. I was just like, tell me everything that's ever gone on with this client. Uh, and obviously, this is not particularly readable, but you can see there's some weird thing, weird thing going on where like, uh, no booking, Penelope Stone. <laughs> Booking, and like, and like, maybe there's also like almost like a war going on about who this person is called. Uh, and so then I asked the question, well, like, like uh, where was this happening? This change, uh, what transaction did it take part in? Tell me everything about that transaction. And I've attached to these things. Uh, we'll talk about it later. But I've attached this, this you know, metadata to the transactions that say like, who's doing it, and like, which command is it part of, and like. Uh, which part of the system is it coming from, and so on. Uh, and I was able to see that this was coming from an ad client one. And so this ad client one was actually renaming an existing client, which is a bug. It's not supposed to do that, right? It's ad client. Uh, and so I was very, very quickly able to track down what was going on. It was like I could just look at the command where that was happening, look at the front end code that was like calling that command, um, uh, and see that I was just like sending, like, ideas to the wrong place and using the wrong validations. But there's the harder and scarier question of what else has Penelope done? Or like, what else has this bug done? Because like, there could be data out there. That bug could have been in production for quite a while uh, and like causing all sorts of hassle. And so I want to know what has been messed up so I can go and clean it up so that I can not wake up in the morning and get like a uh, an email about why there's an eight-hour Brazilian wax for Andy Kitchen. Where they're not expecting that, that to happen. That, that one actually wasn't a bug. I think he just likes to keep it fresh and clean, <laughs> which is fair enough. Um, uh, which, 
Yeah, so I was able to, I was able to ask this question, uh, which ad client commands affected the clients that already existed? Because those were the, like, that was the bug. If an ad client command was run and it was touching a client that was already there in the database, that had already been, that's a fuck one. Excuse me. Um, you, can, you, can beep, you can beep it out. Um, there's like 13 people who, who viewed this on YouTube. Um, okay, I found all the affected data. Yeah, okay. So I, so I was able to just run a single transaction that fixed the data that was messed up uh, based on queries that I was doing to the database. Uh, and then as sugar on top, uh, these, are, these are the way you define the schema in the database, by the way. I was uh, able to uh, give a name to the migration and a URL pointing to the, uh, the place in the engineering notebook that I keep every day where uh, I was hunting down this bug. And so the next time someone's coming along uh, and needs to know why this like, weird manual like, transaction was run, uh, they can see, and, uh, they can see like, my thought process, and they can see links to the, like, where it came from in Slack and the emails and so on. Um, a buzzword here is provenance. There's a lot of stuff about uh, uh, the change that happens to our systems that just kind of gets lost in the noise and doesn't get captured in a way that we can easily query. Uh, this is a great video if you want to learn more about it. Uh, I haven't actually done this yet, but this is just an idea. We're thinking about storing um, uh, deployments, uh, in, like when, whenever we do deploy, storing that in the database, and then whenever a command runs, just attaching the version, attaching the, the version that's running to the command so that if we know that on a, uh, there was a, a deployed version that had a particular regression, we can find all the commands that were run in that version and like, just check that they weren't doing ridiculous stuff. Uh, so to recap, you, you want to get a database that will remember everything forever, uh, hopefully in a manner that will allow you to query it conveniently, because you never know what you'll need in advance. Uh, <laughs> there's costs, <laughs> really, really harsh short-term costs. Uh, modeling change uh, as part of your domain and something that you can query is fantastic and a real winner of an idea and I wish I had it earlier. Uh, there's also more intangible benefits of uh, working with a system like this over the last year, uh, which is that I have a really good time. Uh, when I'm in the shower, I'm thinking about logic programming. I'm thinking about papers I consumed that are actually helping me with my work. Um, Actually, speaking of which, Sharon, is, was Sharon the, um, the lady who was giving the talk two talks ago about monads and error monads? And yes. So, can you help me later on? Because I'm like 80% sure that there's a part of my code base that needs one of your monads, because it's like nested ifs. <laughs> so maybe come and help me later on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I think about it on the weekends, think about it when I go to bed. Uh, and if I can give one tip, like if I can get one piece of advice across, uh, it's that if you're having sex, ye yelling out, yes, I've got it, can be really confusing. <laughs> uh, and that you don't want to have this conversation with your therapist. <laughs> uh, but key point here is that it keeps you motivated, it keeps your employees motivated. Um, and this is a huge business win, but it's kind of intangible. It's kind of intangible because it's hard for the other people at the business to see how much fun you're having and to see that, like, what you look like as you get out of bed and how, like, sad your face is. <laughs> These things are, you know, less tangible, but they're extremely important to keep in mind. Um, intangible costs is, oh, my God, it's really hard going out on a limb and making this long-term bet based on the reading that you've done and the thinking that you've done and saying, yes, I think this is going to work. It's going to be better for us in the long term. Trust me. Because if I'm wrong, then it's going to be extremely embarrassing and like, maybe we'll lose, you know? So, um, so keep in mind, like, there'll be times when people are doubting you and you need to believe in yourself. And it's extremely important that you take the time and energy to be able to articulate your choices. Uh, you need to articulate them. Uh, you need to articulate like, the reasons why you made them uh, and show that you've done the working and the thinking. Uh, and if your business partners are reasonable, they'll listen to you. And if they're smart, they'll agree with you. <laughs> uh, and if they're neither of those things, then why the hell are you in business with them? Um, and the other, the other point is that we are going to be the place where you're booking a massage or like 
booking your nails appointment or Andy Kitchen's going to be getting his waxing done in five years. And, like, I'm still going to be there at CTO having fun. Like, I won't get trapped in this, like, mess of technical debt and get bored and leave. And I'm really excited about it. Um, thanks very much. I have some suggestions for QA. Uh, <laughs> there's these things called speculative transactions where you can kind of be like, what would the database look like if it were given this transaction? Um, I also use uh, like an implementation of Datomic in the browser called DataScript, which uh, means that uh, a page like this is actually just a query in Datalog over the set of all the appointments and employees and whatever's that we have. And there's some very interesting stuff that we can do there, and we have done. Um, uh, there's also this aspect of Datomic called pull, where you're able to take your otherwise fairly flat data and make nested trees, which are great for chucking into React components. Um, and some of that command stuff is pretty interesting. Uh, and the way we're going to use it in our, you know, our eventually better admin system. Um, but these are the things to keep in mind. And um, thanks very much for listening. Am I on? Yes, I am. OK, OK. Um, so we've got some time for questions. If I can see anybody's hand. Here we go. You guys are close together. That's good. Oh, wait. Am I still mic'd up? Because I just want to say one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, searching for elegant solutions is really important. And Christina Pregastis, if you're listening, you are the most elegant solution I've ever found. <laughs> <laughs> questions. <laughs> Um, so I've got a, I guess, a practical question. I think in the terms and conditions of Datomic, um, it's forbidden to probably publish benchmarking results. So my question is, on a practical note, how, how well does it perform in your experience? Wow. So the first part I knew nothing about. So there's like some clause saying like you can't publish benchmark results? So. That's hilarious. Well, all I, can, all I can tell you is that we've never had a problem. I've never had to optimize a query. There's a best practices section on the Datomic documentation that's just like the most restrictive clauses that you're doing over your set of facts about the world. Try to put those first, and things will go faster. But otherwise, uh, like my database, uh, like the data storage thing I use is on like a micro server on EC2. The transactor has I don't know, a few gigabytes of RAM. Our queries are fast enough. The only time I've ever needed to de to denormalize was when I did like. Uh, geo stuff around like latitude, longitude, suburbs, and um, the salons and the distances between them. Um, so yeah, basically I haven't had to think that much about performance in the last year. If that answers your question pretty well. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, the problem I've had with the Datomic, I suppose my question is, have you had this and have you solved it? Um, the problem I've had is whenever you make a schema change, the old bits of schema keep hanging around. And with startups, they're like change, the schema turns over a lot. And we found that after about six months, our schema was just this mess of, oh, we don't use that bit anymore. Ignore it. But it's still there because we can't get rid of it. Have you had that? Do you have any nice solutions for me? Yeah, well, it, it's funny because I've just never run into the problem. As, like the, the schema changes are still there. But I'm kind of glad they're there because they provide a really nice log of how we've changed the schema over time. And we can do queries on those things. Um, can, I, can I ask the question back? Like, what concrete problems did you run into with it? Um, particularly with new staff coming on, they would query um, a particular data structure, and it would come back with 20 fields, only four of which were relevant today. But all the others were historical fields which you can't get rid of out of present queries. Oh, oh no, so, so hang on. You can, um, you can totally just get rid of that. Uh, so if there's something you don't use anymore, you can just retract that fact about the entity. So like, if our accounts had a thing that was like um, whether they're currently having a party and it's a true or a false, and that becomes relevant, uh, irrelevant later on, and we say, All right, that's not a thing that we care about anymore, um, and then we just retract that fact about the entity, and it doesn't show up in queries about them anymore. Yeah. Um, but we should hash it out afterwards. Yeah. Right? Yeah? yeah, come find me. Just take a question. Hey, hey, Alistair, um, can I get a code for a bikini wax? <laughs> <laughs> Another <things>. one? <laughs> Do we have any other real questions? 
I'm going to take that. Oh, yep. Yes. Uh, did you find any performance problems with DataScript? Yes. Uh, so we have two parts to the system. Um, and one of them is the part where, like, that calendar interface I showed you where the salons will update stuff. The other one is where uh, customers will actually go and book. You know, like, it works really nice on mobile, and they can search for stuff. Uh, and performance is constrained because some people use shitty Android phones. In fact, quite a lot of people use shitty Android phones, which are really bad at JavaScript. I don't know if you know this. Um, uh, and so they were surmountable, but it would have taken quite a lot of effort uh, around like using background workers to kind of like batch up operations with transactions. Because there's a pattern we use where we kind of like, hey, server, tell us all the facts that are relevant to about us, and we'll chuck it in our local instance of our Datomic database or a DataScript database. Uh, and that transaction at the start is quite a big and slow one. And so there would have, could have been some stuff around like batching, the, like, uh, like turning those transactions into multiple ones or doing it over stream or in a background, background job. But we just kind of said, fuck it, and didn't use DataScript in that part of the app. So yes. <laughs> Um, one more question, if, if there is any. No? Sweet. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, no worries. <laughs>